Hi everyone, uh, this story that I'm going to read with you here today is called With a Little Help from My Friends, and it's by an Iranian author, uh, Iranian-American author, I should say, called Firoze Dumas, and uh, it's on page 89 in your textbook if you want to follow along, or you can get to the PDF that I posted for you in Canvas. And while we're reading this, um, and just like we've talked about in class, there are some things that I want you looking for. Um, this is going to be part of your assignment that goes with this story, uh, right? These elements of a narrative I want you to be trying to pick out as you read this. So I've listed them here for you, right? But we've got this, you know, a, a situation or a problem, some kind of thing that the story is about, basically. Logical sequence of events, details that show place and time. Um, Story elements, so things like dialogue, description, reflection about the events of the story. A reflective conclusion, and this is something that's um, specific here to this idea of a personal narrative, which is what this story is, so kind of where the author maybe talks about kind of how this all made him or her feel. Uh, and thoughts or feelings about the significance of the event, sort of the same tied idea there. And then, of course, correct grammar, right? Those are things that you would look for in a um, coherent story. Here's our background information and then we'll get started in reading. Once known as Persia, Iran is an oil-rich country in the, in the Middle East. In 1953, the United States had helped to remove Iran's government and to place a shah or king in power. In 1972, when this excerpt begins, so here's our year here, the Iranian government had, was still a monarchy led by the shah. However, seven years later, during the Iranian Revolution of, 17, or of 1979, the country would undergo the political upheaval the author refers to in her first sentence. The Shah would be overthrown and replaced with a government that was unfriendly to, to the United States. Many Americans returned to the hostility. So as you read the story, you're going to see that this change gets mentioned at the end of the story, right? The sort of change in attitude towards Iran. I was lucky to have come to America years before the political upheaval in Iran. The Americans we encountered were kind and curious, unafraid to ask questions and willing to listen. As soon as I spoke enough English to communicate, I found myself being interviewed nonstop by children and adults alike. My life became one long-running Oprah show, minus the free luxury accom accommodations in Chicago and Oprah. On the topic of Iran, American minds were tabula rasa, which basically down here right, explains that they were a blank slate. People in the U.S. didn't know anything about Iran at this time. People didn't know anything. Right, this is the 1970s. Judging from the questions asked, it was clear that most Americans in 1972 had never heard of Iran. We did our best to educate. You know Asia? Well, you go south at the Soviet Union, and there we are. Or we try to be more bucolic, mentioning being south of the beautiful Caspian Sea, where the famous caviar comes from. Most people in Whittier, this is in California, did not know about the famous caviar. And once we explained what it was, they'd scrunch up their faces. Fish eggs, they would say. Gross. We tried mentioning our proximity to Afghanistan or Iraq but it was no use. Having exhausted our geographical clues, we would say, you've heard of India, Japan, or China? Uh, we're on the same continent. We had always known that our country is a small country and that America is very big, but even as a seven-year-old, details about our narrator here, I was surprised that so many Americans had never noticed us on the map. Perhaps it's like driving a Yugo and realizing that the 18-wheeler can't see you. That's a Yugo. Go down here and look, right? That's a small car that was manufactured in Yugoslavia. Reference from a few decades ago. In Iran, geography is a requirement at every grade. Since the government issues textbooks, every student studies the same material in the same grade. In first grade geography, I had to learn the shape of Iran and the location of its capital, Tehran. I had to memorize that we shared borders with Turkey, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and the USSR the Soviet Union, which is, um, you know, Russia now and other countries. I also knew that I lived on the continent of Asia. None of the kids in Whittier, a city an hour outside of Los Angeles, 
had ever asked me about geography. They wanted to know about more important things, such as camels. How many did we own back home? What did we feed them? Was it a bumpy ride? I always disappointed them by admitting that I had never seen a camel in my entire life. And as far as a ride goes, our Chevrolet was rather smooth. They reacted as if I had told them that there really was a person in the Mickey Mouse costume. We were also asked about electricity, tents, and the Sahara. Once again, we disappointed, admitting that we had electricity, that we did not own a tent, and that the Sahara was on another continent. So she's just giving lots of examples of how much the people she interacts with don't know about where she comes from, but that they're curious, they want to know. So she said the people were blank slates and she's giving evidence for yes, that really is the case. So I'm just gonna write over here in the margins for myself, people really don't know anything. Intent to remedy the image of our homeland as backward, my father took it upon himself to enlighten Americans whenever possible. So he wants Americans to know about Iran. That's his goal. Any unsuspecting American who asked my father a question received, as a bonus, a lecture on the successful history of the petroleum industry in Iran, right? That's the oil industry. And let's see, so a lecture, right? So he talks for a long time. As my father droned on, I watched the faces of these kind Americans who were undoubtedly making mental notes never to talk to a foreigner again. So basically, she's saying that her dad tells people more than they wanted to know. My family and I wondered why Americans had such a mistaken image of Iran. We were offered a clue one day by a neighbor who told us that he knew about Iran because he had seen Lawrence of Arabia. Well, whoever Lawrence was, he had, we had never heard of him, we said. My father then explained that Iranians are an Indo-European people. We are not Arabs. We do, however, have two things in common with Saudi Arabia, he continued, Islam and petroleum. Now, I won't bore you with religion, he said, but let me tell you about the petroleum industry. So this is, again, her father going into his lecture that she was talking about just a minute ago. Another neighbor, a kindly old lady who taught me how to take care of indoor plants, asked whether we had made many cats back home. My father, with his uncanny ability to for forge friendships, said, we don't keep pets in our homes. They are dirty. But your cats are so beautiful, our neighbor said. We had no idea what she was talking about. Seeing our puzzled express expressions, she showed us a picture of a beautiful long-haired cat. It's a Persian cat, she said. That was news to us. The only cats we had ever seen back home were the mangy strays that ate scraps behind people's houses. From that day, when I told people I was from Iran, I added, where Persian cats come from. That impressed them. This is this learning experience, right? She is trying to describe a learning how to talk to people about where she is from. It's funny that in the end, she ends up talking about something that really isn't that significant to her. They didn't have cats, but this is what she figures out as a way to connect with people. I tried my best to be worth, a worthy representative of my homeland, but like a Hollywood celebrity, celebrity relentlessly pursued by paparazzi, I sometimes got tired of the questions. I, however, never punched anybody with my fists. I used words. One boy at school had a habit of asking me particularly stupid questions. One day he inquired about camels again. This time, perhaps foreshadowing a vocation in storytelling, I told him that, yes, we had camels, a one hump and a two hump. The one hump belonged to my parents, and the two hump was for our was our family station wagon. His eyes widened. Where do you keep them? he asked. In the garage, of course, I told him. Having heard what he wanted to hear, he ran off to share his knowledge with the rest of the kids on the playground. He was very angry once he realized that I had fooled him, but at least he never asked me another question. Often kids tried to be funny by chanting, I ran to Iran, I ran to Iran. The correct pronunciation, I always informed them, is Iran. I ran is a sentence, I told them, as in I ran away from my geography lesson. 
Older boys often ask me to teach them some bad words in your language. At first, I politely refused. My refusal merely increased their determination, so I solved the problem by teaching them the phrase man karam, which means I'm an idiot. I told them that what I was teaching them was so nasty that they should have to promise never to repeat it to anyone. They would then spend all of recess running around yelling, I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot. I never told them the truth. I figured that someday somebody would. But we're finding out a little bit about our narrator, right? We know that she's got a sense of humor. She's proud about where she comes from. And she likes to um, maybe, she's clever, right? She's playing jokes on people, but they don't really realize that she is. The narrator, I'll say a sense of humor. And uses intelligence. Oops, I can't write, sorry. Intelligence. You play but almost every person who asks us a question asks us with kindness this is important questions were often followed by suggestions of places to visit in california at school the same children who inquired about camels often shared their food with me i bet you've never tried an oreo have one or my mom just baked these peanut butter cookies and she sent you one Kids invited me to their houses to show me what their rooms looked like. On Halloween, one family brought over a costume, knowing that I would surely be the only kid in the Halloween parade without one. If someone had been able to encapsulate the kindness of these second graders in pill form, the pills would undoubtedly put many war correspondents out of business. And by that, she means that that would end war, right? If people could be as kind as these kids were, we wouldn't have wars. So this is really important, right? People are kind. Everybody were this kind, there would be no more war. Almost two years, after almost two years in Whittier, my father's assignment was completed and we had to return home. The last month of our stay, I attended, I attended one slumber party after another, all thrown in my honor. This avalanche of kindness did not make our impending departure any easier. Everyone wanted to know when we would come back to America. We had no answer, but we invited them all to visit us in Iran. I knew no one would ever take us up on our offer because Iran was off the radar screen for most people. My friends considered visiting their grandmothers in Oregon to be a long trip. So visiting me in Iran was like taking a left turn at the next moon. It wasn't going to happen. I didn't know then that I would indeed be returning to America about two years later. Between frenzied trips to Sears to buy presents for our relatives back home, my mother spent her last few weeks giving gifts to our American friends. I'd wondered why my mother had brought so many Persian handicrafts with her. Now I knew. Everyone from my teachers to the crossing guard to the brownie leader to the neighbors received something. Yeezy's from my country. Es especially for you, she would explain. These handicrafts, which probably turned up in garage sales the following year, were received with tears and promises to write. So again, kindness. This is the theme, that there's this connection between people and that they're treating each other with kindness and appreciation. My mother was particularly sad to return to Iran. I had always assumed that she would be relieved to return to her family and to a land where she spoke the language and didn't need me to act as her interpreter. But I realized later that even though my mother could not understand anything the crossing guard, Mrs. Popkins said, she understood that this woman looked out for me and she understood her smiles. So this is kind of this nice idea of sort of this, you know, communication without language. that we can understand people even if we can't talk to them. Even though my mother never attended a brownie meeting, she knew that the leader, Carrie's mom, opened up her home to us each every week and led us through all kinds of projects. No one paid her for this. And my mo mother knew that when it had been my turn to bring snacks for the class, one of the moms had stepped in and baked cupcakes. My best friend Connie's older sister, Michelle, had tried to teach me to ride a bike. And Heather's mom, although single with two daughters, had hosted me overnight more times than I can remember. 
Even though I had been the beneficiary of all of the attention, my mother, watching silently from a distance, had also felt the warmth of generosity and kindness. It was hard to read. When my parents and I get together today, we often talk about our first year in America. Even though 30 years have passed, our memories have not faded. We remember the kindness more, ne- more than ever, knowing that our relatives who immigrated to this country after the Iranian Revolution did not encounter the same America. Right? So people change. And this gets back to that background information, right? After the Iranian Revolution, the U.S. and, and Iran were no longer on friendly terms, and so then people in the U.S. did not receive them as kindly. They saw Americans who had bumper stickers on their cars that read, Iranians go home, or we play cowboys and Iranians. The Americans they met rarely invited them to their houses. These Americans felt that they knew all about Iran and its people, and they had no questions, just opinions. My relatives did not think Americans were very kind. Interesting contrast there at the end, and we will definitely talk more about that and kind of these different views of America from, from, um, from this perspective in class. That is all for now.